just call the uh, house to order. Say it again. I'm going to call the house to order. Sure. Good luck. <laughs> Good morning. I hate to break up this great buzz that's going on in this room, but we need to get started with our keynote address and the rest of the day. I'm Mike Lemus. Welcome to the fifth sustainability conference sponsored by the Tulsa Community College Sustainability Committee. If you take your seats, please, I'm, we're going to have the introduction first of our keynote and then our keynote speaker. So thank you. It's turned out to be a beautiful day. The sun's shining. We're very pleased about that. And it's uh, extended to this room as well. It's been a great morning so far. It's my pleasure to introduce Assistant Director of Facilities, also sustainable Sustainability Committee member, uh, Key Moss, who will do the introduction of our keynote. Key. Good morning. This is to introduce our keynote speaker, Megan Faye Zarnizer. Megan Faye Zarnizer has been with ASHI for 10 years and previously held the positions of Director of Programs and STARS Program Manager. Prior to ASHI, Megan worked as a sustainability specialist at Nelson, where she provided sustainability expertise and consulting services to various clients. She also spent five years working at US Green Buildings Council. Megan also worked as an environmental educator for the University at Buffalo Green Office, organizing campus and community education focused on energy conservation, green building, and sustainable living. Now let's welcome Megan. Thank you, Key. Can everybody hear me okay? Groovy, good morning. Thanks to everyone um, for being here, and thanks to the Sustainability Committee for inviting me to be here. This is my first time in Tulsa. I'm enjoying every moment of it thus far. Um, Mike, Rob, Cindy, Jamie, thank you for all your work in getting me here and preparing for this conference. It's obviously a great event. I've really enjoyed just meeting folks that have been presenting um, the different posters and look forward to meeting with all of you. So I've been asked to come talk to you today about the role of higher education in advancing sustainability. This is sort of the work that I've dedicated myself to for the past 10 years. But I thought I would give you a little bit of context as to how it is that I came to be before you today. Um, and then talking about sort of the important role that, that higher ed plays in our larger movement. But before we do that, sustainability is a term that we hear often, and I think uh, within ASHI, we have to sort of, uh, sort of deal with the interpretation sometimes that sustainability just means environmental issues. And in actuality, AISHI's definition, as you can see here, we define sustainability in an inclusive way, encompassing human and ecological health, social justice, secure livelihoods, and a better world for all generations. So today, when I use that term, I'm not just thinking about sort of the traditional facilities-oriented um, environmental issues, wastewater, et cetera, but really thinking about economic, social, as well as environmental indicators. So hopefully that's sort of a, a context for, again, the presentation here. Here because again, I think oftentimes we're, we're dealing with this misinterpretation that we're just thinking about the environmental lens when in actuality, the social and environmental and economic dimensions are so intertwined. So context for who I am, why, why I'm here, and the fact is that I'm incredibly passionate about sustainability, so I'm gonna tell you really how I started that journey. So 1997, I was a sophomore at the University of Buffalo, and I had no clue what I wanted to do. And I was incredibly overwhelmed by the uh, decision of declaring a major. And this was like my, I don't know, 19-year-old crisis. I just was like feeling the pressure of needing to determine what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I had studied psychology for the first year, and it was interesting, but it didn't feel quite right. And I remember calling my dad, thankfully I have loving and supportive parents, and my dad let, let me vent to him and um, basically just explained that I was like losing it. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And I had always really identified my dad as an educated man. He has two master's degrees, um, and sort of I always looked up to him, and he said, Meg, do you know what my undergrad degree is in? I like paused, I was like, I actually, I have no clue. He has a master's in counseling, an MBA. And I was like, I have no idea what you studied as an undergrad. And he was like, classical languages. And I paused and I was like, not sure how to process this. And he was like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I was like, wow. And 
of course it matters to some extent, but that was exactly what I needed to hear in that moment because it sort of released this pressure of me needing to make this one decision that would steer the rest of my life or the fact that I needed to have one job in mind for what I wanted to do. And the truth was, I had no clue. Does anyone here sort of resonate with that experience? Yeah, sure, so it's okay. Uh, and in fact, all of the positions that I've held in my career, I wouldn't have even thought existed when I was back at an, as an undergrad. Um, so along the same time, and I wish I could say it was the same week, but the truth is I don't really know, a friend of mine came and said, do you wanna go to a meeting with me about an internship opportunity? And I was feeling open. I was like, sure, why not? I knew nothing about the internship, but I was just like, I'll hang out with my friend Randy. I'll learn something new, fine. So that was a decision that changed the entire direction of my career, my life, really, um, because it was an internship to participate in a semester-long effort with UB's energy officer to do a waste audit of campus, reminiscent <laughs> of OSU's work over here. If you haven't checked out the poster, you should. Um, so basically, I, I worked with a team of five folks uh, to do a waste audit. So here we are in hazmat suits, and I will say OSU has done a fantastic job at prioritizing safety. We tried, <laughs> but look, hearing all of what they've done to protect everybody involved in the waste audit, I'm realizing that we, uh, we could have done more, but as a sophomore um, and working with Walter Simpson, who's not pictured here, who really is, is to this day my mentor, uh, we had an absolutely incredible time, dis despite the fact that we were sort of knee deep in waste for one solid day. But we spent the entire semester planning for this, this one day that we would do a dumpster dive on campus. And the idea was to create an educational opportunity around uh, like the most sort of focal point on campus. Um, and having a day's worth of trash just piled up and people walking by, going to class and being like, what is happening there? <laughs> um, and unsurprisingly, what we learned as a result of that, that day was, I, I do think we reached a number of people uh, that were just sort of trying to understand what was happening and getting them to realize like, wow, that's a lot of waste. Um, but unsurprisingly, we identified that there was upwards of 70% of UB's waste stream that could otherwise be diverted, recycled, composted, et cetera. Uh, as a result of that, we created and generated some momentum, and I then sort of had direction, this, this sort of uh, direction I'd been seeking uh, as of, I guess it was the end of my sophomore year. I changed my major um, at the University of Buffalo. At the time, it was interdisciplinary studies, which uh, allowed me to sort of focus in on environmental studies and community mental health. To this day, I believe that in order to have a healthy planet, we need healthy people, and in order to have healthy people, we need a healthy planet. Kind of basic. Um, I had uh, declared my major, and then I also worked with two of the women that are pictured in this uh, photo to create the UB Green office. Uh, and this was with Walter Simpson, again, UB's energy officer, who was housed in facilities. And uh, the other piece that I did was I started, um, this is uh, the magnet that's on our fridge from, what, 20 years ago, the Think Green campaign that the UB Green office uh, started throughout our, I guess it was my junior and senior year. We really created so much educational opportunities on campus, reminiscent of the work that's happening around the room here today, and I'm sure back on your campuses. And the fact that this was you know, the late 90s, there was not a lot of activity that we were seeing from peer institutions. Um, but we still uh, had a, a passionate group of people together, um, both within my, my school, my classes, the academic realm, within the UB Green office with Walter and his team, but then also um, within the Student Environmental Network. And I know there's a lot of students here today, student-led um, student -led activism, I would say, is probably what changed UB's direction in their sustainability commitment. So we had the UB Environmental Network. I would think I was like vice president or something like that. And we were activists. We recognized that the university was not doing enough um, in terms of their sustainability performance. And we told them. <laughs> we told them in a number of different ways. Uh, and I will say, I mentioned this last night with the, the sustainability committee that one of the sort of true markers of success, um, I think of the work that happened back in the late 90s on UB's campus, is one of the biggest um, proponents of sustainability, the work that we were trying to do within the facilities department is now on the sustainability team, which is like huge. 
And I think that was one of the first pieces that sort of I realized that real systemic change really takes time. Um, but as the eager, enthusiastic, and motivated students, we wanted to see that change happen much faster. Um, so this photo is here, the dandelions, because it was senior year, we learned that ahead of commencement, the university decided that dandelions were ugly and wanted to spray uh, pesticides to get rid of the dandelions. The pesticide that they we're gonna use had a known carcinogen. So understandably so, we decided that was not cool. And the UB Environmental Network did what all of you I'm sure would do. We formed the Dandelion Liberation Brigade. <laughs> the DLB. Uh, so the DLB, we created t-shirts. And it, honestly, even looking back, I wish that what, my memories were a little bit more like clear. We did all of this in a matter of like weeks. We created t-shirts, educational campaigns. At this point, I mean, I was a senior, so my academics, were, it was a little bit lower on the list. <laughs> my activism work was definitely number one. Um, but the momentum that we had and sort of the energy we had looking back, it was just, it was really impressive. So, um, I mean, we did incredible activism work. We got on the, the UB, the president did a um, talk show on the local radio station where every week where somebody could call in. And this woman um, who was like fielding the calls to make sure it would be okay. Um, my colleague, Erin, who started the UB Green office with me and is still there to this day, amazing. Erin uh, called in and she said, they, you know, the woman who answered, who was fielding the calls, was like, well, what are you going to ask about? And she was like, pesticides. And the woman's like, no thanks. And she was like, I don't know how Erin knew this, but she was like, do you have children? And she was like, yes. And she's like, do you know they plan on spraying this pesticide outside of the daycare? And she was like, I'll put you right through. <laughs> so Erin on the local radio station was able to get through and like task the president, unfortunately, in the like short snippet. We didn't get the, of course we won't do this. Never mind, that was a bad idea. Um, but we staged uh, um, basically this uh, day of activism on campus where we had, in the weeks leading up to this, uh, this protest, camped out in the student union. On the opposite side of this, this is this beautiful image of a dandelion that one of our friends painted. And we tried to raise awareness about this is the plan. This is what the institution's gonna do. This is not cool and totally like, unrealistic, why do we want to get rid of dandelions anyways? We did educational campaigns around dandelions and the benefits of dandelions. Um, and the culinary folks would probably appreciate that too. Um, so we had all these signatures, and because you can't really see it, I will read this. This is what we said. Greetings from the Dandelion Liberation Brigade, an organization started at the University of Buffalo in Buffalo, New York, for the liberation of all beings. We, the undersigned, hereby demand the halt of all chemical lawn spraying on UB grounds. Under no circumstances should aesthetics take prior priority over ecosystem and human health. Therefore, until pesticides are eliminated from use, the University of Buffalo is deemed unsafe for the university, community, and surrounding areas. Badass, right? I mean, like, I would never talk like that now. <laughs> never. <laughs> so totally badass. And uh, we hand delivered this, uh, that uh, postcard to the president's office. And we waited, right? And we waited and we waited. And here we made the front page of the Buffalo News. My parents' proudest moment. <laughs> Me on the cover of the Buffalo News. And I haven't gotten a cover since. So students pay, pay attention. Like the power of the student voice is pretty impressive. Um, but so the thing is, we won, right? So the student, the administration said, fine, we won't spray it. But it was one of those that um, it didn't really feel like 100% of a win, right? Because it felt like they were like, oh, fine, once they go away and all graduate next year, then we'll do it next year. So it didn't feel like this systemic change that we were really, really looking for. Um, and we were also nervous, right? Because so many of the student activists uh, that had l championed all the work we're leaving, we were graduating, and a lot of us were super psyched to get out of Buffalo. <laughs> so it was a matter of like, is this actually going to create um, the change? And I've already shared with you that, um, that it has. UB is now, especially in, within the state, but I'd say even in the country, one of the exemplary universities championing sustainability efforts. And what we didn't see at the time, and especially nowadays with our reliance on, on smartphones, et cetera, we expect sort of like instant gratification, right? And that's what we wanted at the time because we felt that the stakes were so high. So like you're gonna spray something that could wind up making us sick. Why would you do that, right? 
Um, but we, what we didn't see and what I'll probably never know is how much the student activism that we led back in the late 90s led to um, systemic policy change within the institution. And I was invited back to campus, which was a big deal, because I was like, are you sure you want me coming back to campus? Oh, actually, one more story. So before I came back to campus, graduation day, right? So graduation day, we had won, right? The dandelions were still there. Uh, and it was such a huge university. So the um, commencement ceremony happened in like our alumni arena. And we had our one moment of fame like with our image on the jumbotron as we're shaking the president's hands. And I was like, I need one more opportunity <laughs> to have a lasting impact here. So that morning, um, it was just me. Nobody else did it. I, instead of shaking the president's hand on stage, I presented him with a hand-picked bouquet of dandelions. <laughs> and uh, he hugged me. He hugged me, and he laughed. And I think that was something, too. Um, my, my mentor, again, who to this day still guides me in a lot of my work that I do, Walter Simpson, he's no longer at the institution. He's retired. But I think Walter grew up as an activist in the 60s, 70s, where it was like, we need to fight. And don't get me wrong, like a lot of the student-led activism had some anger in it. But um, because that's not my go-to, anger and sort of like being aggressive, uh, I think the president, excuse me, recognized that, like, I'm just trying to do the right thing here. Um, and he laughed and, you know, again, I have no idea if he's like inwardly like huge eye roll is like, get these students off of my campus. I'm so tired of them. Um, but years later, unfortunately, the president um, that uh, was there when I was an undergrad had passed away. But I was invited back to campus, which again was like a big deal. And this, um, this man, Don Erb, who had just, and he said, he's like, Megan, we just, you were so annoying. Right? Like that was how we were looked at. It was just like, oh, they're just telling us. And they're, I think a lot of them were sort of like, they're kids. Come on, they're kids. We're not going to pay attention. But he's like, what you folks started, and this was again in the like late, mid to late 90s, he's like, we just didn't know any better. But you guys helped us realize that there was a better way to do things. So again, in terms of the sort of syst systemic change that I think we're really striving for to create a sustainable world, it's one example, at least in my experience, that there's a lot more happening behind the scenes than I think we even realized. And we've got to hope that that positive outcome is really going to happen. So. Um, that's a little bit of me and why I'm here, and I think the passion that was ignited in me that sophomore year of this, this dedication to I really want to create uh, a healthy world for the planet, as well as the people living within it, um, that sort of set me on my track. And in thinking, I've given a lot of presentations about sort of the evolution of sustainability in higher education. And with that, I think it's really important to look back, to understand where we've come from, to understand that you know, I stand before you representing an organization with hundreds, almost a thousand institutions that represent decades of change, decades of work towards advancing a sustainability uh, movement. So this timeline here is by no means a comprehensive timeline of every important move in the sustainability and higher education movement, but rather through my lens, it's sort of some of the important milestones of the past couple of decades that have led to where we are right now. And again, I just think it's really important that we recognize the work that's been happening for generations, really. So in, in 1987, our common future, uh, anybody heard of it? The Brundtland Commission? Okay. So um, essentially, this UN report, uh, often referred to as the Brundtland Commission, was pretty much the first time that we came up with a definition for sustainable development. Sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So the US, and this is not just about present, but over the past couple of decades, hasn't always had the strongest relationship with the UN, the United Nations. But I do think it's important. I've been lucky enough to do work outside of the United States pretty much when you leave if of the United States, the UN is seen as a very authoritative body. Like if the UN says something, we're gonna follow it. So the fact that this came out from the UN, sustainable development, what that led and what, what that really um, sort of catalyzed was a conversation worldwide around what does sustainable development mean? What does it mean within our country? What does it mean within our sectors? What does it mean with our companies, et cetera? Um, from that, the Brundtland Commission, understandably so, higher education institutions from throughout the world were thinking, well, wait a minute, we have a really important role here in, in sort of creating the future leaders of tomorrow, 
understanding that we want to create a sustainable world, we want to advance sustainable development, what's our role as higher education institutions in contributing to that future? So I won't read through all of this, but the Talwar Declaration came together with a few Ivy Plus league, uh, league institutions throughout the world, really, um, that said, like, we need to create this commitment. We need institutions to sign on to say, yes, we recognize our responsibility, not just opportunity, but responsibility in teaching and educating uh, the, the students that are coming through our walls in preparing them to create a sustainable future. Um, so the Talwar Declaration, again, sort of built on the success of the Brundtland Commission of, of creating conversations throughout our sector. Um, but there, you know, there's no perfect program, there's no perfect uh, initiative, and it was one of these pieces that it was voluntary. Um, we, when we were on campus, we were trying to get our president to sign it. He didn't. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was voluntary. There was no sense of accountability. So while it was like a feel-good thing, it was sort of like... How do we know they're actually changing anything at these institutions to sort of fulfill the Talwar Declaration? So this is very specialized, and you might be like, why are you talking about a green building rating system in uh, the spirit of higher education? The truth is, is that LEED, and how many of you are familiar with LEED? Great, curvy. So LEED launched in the late 90s. In fact, as a, um, at the UB Green Office, we were doing a green building educational programs around uh, creating green buildings, and obviously that was when LEED came out. Um, I joined the US Green Building Council as a staff person in 02, and at the time, LEED, or USGBC and LEED was like this teeny tiny little organization. I was employee number 10. There's like 400 uh, in individuals working at this nonprofit. It's an incredible organization. And LEED, there are more um, square, there's more LEED certified square footage on higher education campuses than in any other sector. So I think institutions of higher education that were building on these conversations of sustainable development, understanding that the Talwar Declaration, sure, that's sort of an interesting conversation. Conversation, but like, what more can we be doing? LEED created this opportunity for institutions to say, okay, we want to build a green building, or we want to renovate a building to be LEED. Um, so it really did foster sort of this conversation of advancing and actually having a, a space where it was like, this is, this is representative of our commitment to sustainability. So Paul Hawken, anybody here know about Paul Hawken? He's sort of one of the, I'd say, um, true icons within the sustainability community. He has uh, written a number of books. This is just one of them. But again, in the spirit of looking back, natural capitalism sort of changed the minds and the hearts of so many corporate leaders. Um, Ray Anderson, who's just a phenomenal human, sadly passed away a few years ago. He started uh, Interface, the largest um, carpet manufacturer in the country. Uh, in the world, actually. Um, they're based in uh, Georgia. And Ray, he read this book, and he had his moment of, like, my whole organization is just, like, raping and pillaging the planet. And he had this, like, moment of, like, this is my contribution to the world. And decide he called Paul Hawken, and he was like, you need to come meet with me. And Paul, this true hero uh, who's been an author for, for decades, who, again, as you can see here, delivered the harsh truths, such as every li living system on Earth is in decline. There hasn't been a peer-reviewed scientific pa paper released in 40 years that contradicts that statement. The, the real truth, hard realities that we've been facing now and that, frankly, are only getting worse um, have sort of these highlights among them, right? Like Ray realizing this opportunity that he had to transform his company, and Interface now has been like just lifted up as such a model and example of how corporate change can actually happen um, as a result of leadership, right? As a result of this vision and a commitment at the top. Um, so, and actually, I just saw Paul Hawken um, speak at an, uh, a conference earlier this year. And he's, again, such a renowned figure, like has been around for a really long time, is held in high, high regard. And he shared with me another interesting fact that may not go over with a higher ed crowd because we're all striving for advanced degrees. But he, Paul Hawken, does not have one degree to his name. He didn't graduate from high school. He didn't graduate from college. He has no further degree, which I find really interesting. And number one, it sort of speaks to the opportunity and um, uh, impact that creativity and innovation can have, I think it also speaks to the privilege that him as a white man had. Um, but nonetheless, it was just a really interesting fact. And 
you know, Paul Hawken, he has a, a new book called Project Drawdown. Has anybody heard about that? Yeah, so Project Drawdown is, is definitely a, a sort of um, talked about right now on a lot of campuses. So he's done some really, really great work. And uh, again, he among the scientists and hundreds, if not thousands, of, of leaders throughout the sustainability world have tried to really hit on the stakes. Uh, and I don't like to dwell here because easily we can basically hear these stakes and be like, I'm not going to get out of bed anymore. That's it. Um, but I choose a path of optimism, right? And instead of focusing on all of the horrible things that sometimes feel inevitable, uh, I'd rather work toward what I actually believe to be possible, which is trying to um, negate or trying to actually um, change some of these potential impacts. But these are just a sampling of some of the true um, environmental and societal challenges that we're facing. Um, from air pollution, 52,000 people are dying each year as a result of exposure to emissions. Like, these are things that I feel like, frankly, we don't hear about a lot. Oceans and plastics, I mean, obviously there's a huge commitment to trying to reduce plastic. The fact that there's 9 million tons of plastic in our oceans each year. Do you guys know about the great plastic garbage patch in the ocean? I mean just horrible. And obviously that's impacting not only ocean life, but all of the people that are relying on food from the ocean. Um, rising seas and extreme weather, obviously this is sort of now not just a national conversation, but a global conversation and recognizing that the impacts of climate change are going to disproportionately impact people of color, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, communities throughout the world climate refugees, what's going to be happening as a result of people needing to move to find water, food, et cetera, um, and obviously decrease in food production and qual quality water supply. There's books written now about how there's going to be water wars. So again, this is like stark, and it gets um, at my sort of core of my being, I could easily, again, just sort of be like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. However, what I do like to hear about is the potential. Right, so this is where, especially within higher education, which is a sector sort of unlike any other um, that is based on innovation and creativity and opportunity and the, uh, the option and sort of the, the space for learning new things, trying out new things. So this is stats just in the United States. We're roughly about 4,000 institutions of higher education, right? So about 1,600 two-year, 2,400 um, four-year institutions. Um, imagine if this spring, with the graduating students that will be leaving two-year, four-year institutions, every single one of those students was equipped with the knowledge, the tools, and the skills to be able to address sustainability challenges regardless of career path, right? Regardless of their course of study, that's the work that we're doing. And frankly, that's the work of the 900 plus institutions of higher education that are committed to sustainability that I represent. That's what they're doing. Uh, and that's what many of you are doing here as representative um, of the, some of the posters. So this is where I try and focus. And I've been like really lucky in my career instead of like many of you who are the individual change agents at some of these institutions um, banging your head against the wall <laughs> trying to get things to change from the inside out. I've been really lucky to be uh, at the helm of organizations that are supporting change agents. So essentially, as a result of all of the evolution of the Talwar Declaration, you know, Paul Hawkins' books, David Orr's books, um, focused on higher education, uh, in the early, I guess it was mid-2000s, there were more positions being created to be like, we need to focus on sustainability. Let's hire a director of sustainability. And this was happening both in the corporate sector as well as in higher education. So this image here sort of depicts the, the growth of those types of positions, directors of sustainability, sustainability coordinator, sustainability assistant, et cetera, on campuses um, throughout the country. I actually think Canada is included in this study as well. So basically, AISHI grew out of this small organization in the Pacific Northwest that was sort of trying to share resources and be like, how are you doing this on your campus? How have you integrated sustainability into the curriculum there? How are you trying to reduce your waste there? 
this sharing of resources pretty quickly in 2004 or so, it became clear this is a national organization. We, we have enough interest here and enough demand to support a national organization. And that's how we came to being. We exist to basically inspire and catalyze higher education to lead the global sustainability transformation. That's AISHI's mission. And AISHI, it's like a mouthful, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. Um, that's our acronym. So we exist to basically provide resources and tools to faculty, staff, and administrators, anyone in higher education that's working to advance your institution's sustainability goals, our job is to make your job more easy, uh, easier. Um, and I think what's really important to note is that sustainability lives in different places, on different campuses, right? Even the folks here in this room, some of you might be from facilities, others are academics, others are administrators, obviously students. So recognizing that sustainability lives in all these different places, that means that our organization is made up of a really nice uh, mixture of people. Um, we have an annual conference each year and it is an opportunity, again, for sharing best practices, for sharing warnings, like don't do this, uh, for sharing uh, just highlights of, of sort of the successes of our campuses. Um, so I wanna talk about just a couple of the things that we do before honing in on some sort of key success stories, I think some from some notable campuses. So if anybody's interested um, in learning more about what's happening around uh, campus sustainability or sustainability in higher education, we put out a weekly bulletin, it's an e-newsletter, it's free, anybody can subscribe. If you're just interested in trying to stay up to speed with, uh, with what's going on, you can subscribe. And I should have noted this earlier, I'm happy to share these slides, so don't feel like you have to be writing things down. Um, but the, the bulletin is, uh, is a great resource. And to sort of identify the spectrum of the institutions that we represent, I had a, a member called, and uh, I would say we, we rep represent institutions that have been longstanding sustainability champions. Uh, as well as those that are just beginning their sustainability journey, right? So all the types of institutions along that spectrum. And I recognize and understand that the folks that have been doing this work for decades, they are looking to continue pushing the envelope on what's possible. And one of those institutions called me, and there was a headline here celebrating an institution who had just uh, achieved a LEED Silver building on their campus. And this one person said, Megan, we cannot be celebrating lead silver buildings. Like, are you kidding me? That's not, that should not be the goal here that we're striving for. And I said, yes, I understand what you're saying. We want to be striving for more. We want lead platinum buildings. We want um, obviously more than that. However, we need to recognize that there's um, steps in place that we need to take. And that lead silver building on that campus could be the catalyst to large scale systemic change. So our job, AISHI's job, is to recognize all of those celebratory steps whatever they look like on the sustainability journey, um, to make sure that there are, um, that sustainability is, at least in the, the eyes of Aishi, that we're about the positive recognition associated with that journey. Not about like, I mean, if, if we had said to that campus, like, no, we're not gonna do the, uh, promote that or publicize that, because it's not good enough, Who's motivated to do more? No one, like that's, that's not the right thing. So in any event, and after sharing that perspective with this person over here, she was like, oh right. And I was like, right, you're from a wealthy institution that has plenty of resources, you don't get it. But let's remember, there's a lot of other institutions uh, that are under-resourced, underfunded, understaffed, a lot of institutions in that category, that that success, that Lead Silver Building or something like that needs to be widely celebrated. So. There are things like that in our Aishi Bulletin. Similar, we also have Aishi Awards, um, and this is such an opportunity. We uh, continually hear each year, like, do more awards, like more award categories, because again, any light that we can shine on the positive work that's happening within research, academics, as well as operations, is a good thing to do. So it's a great platform, and especially for some of the posters here, something you might want to think about. Our um, application for Aishi Awards is going to be open soon, uh, if you're interested. We also have a Campus Sustainability Hub online resources, and you can see uh, this is sort of broken down into basically all aspects of campus. If you're a member of AISHI, because we are a nonprofit membership association, and it's institutional membership, so you might be thinking, is my institution a member? Um, 
if you're a member, all, every single person on your campus can benefit from our resources. Uh, so there was a, you know, a question over here about uh, OSU, and we were talking about academic programs, and I was like, well, if any of your students are wondering, well, where are the sustainable design programs that I should be looking at? That's a resource that we can provide for you. So our hub provides um, tools and best practices. If you're looking, a faculty member that's looking to incorporate sustainability into your curriculum, if you're a student looking to lead a banning bottled water on campus, or a director of sustainability that's looking for a GHG reduction plan, these are the types of resources we offer. There's thousands in there. Um, again, sort of a couple of years ago, we partnered with 14 institutions throughout the U.S. and two in Canada um, to essentially recognize that we had been offering training for faculty for about a decade, but the scale was just not really what we needed or what we wanted to be able to achieve the, the results that we're looking for. So we partnered with these institutions that were already doing this type of faculty training around incorporating sustainability into the curriculum. Um, and this has enabled us to basically serve probably 10 times more people by working with these institutions to have faculty from all different disciplines coming to say, how do I incorporate sustainability into my curriculum? Whether it's biology, math, art history, you name it. These are sort of opportunities for faculty to better understand. Um, how they can incorporate sustainability in the curriculum. We also have a mentorship program. At our annual conference, I've had people come up to me um, saying, like, thank you for the work you do. Because in many cases, our sustainability coordinators are uh, you know, passionate 24-year-old who is like the sole person sort of <laughs> somewhere hidden away in facilities trying to figure out how they can be the catalyst for change. And then they come to the ACP conference, they're like, here are my people. Um, so it really, it's sort of like a support group in a way. And that's why we created the mentorship program a couple of years ago to really try and help the more, uh, the, the beginners really as a sustainability professional paired up with more seasoned professionals to really help them be most effective. Stars. So um, when I started at ACHE 10 years ago, I came on board to launch this program. I could easily talk about it for a long time. So I'm going to look for Rob to give me the sign to cut it off. Um, so Stars is the sustainability tracking assessment and rating system. Lead measures a building, right? A building's and basically defines a green building. Stars is looking at an entire institution of higher education and recognizing it for its sustainability performance. So it's all about positivity, positive recognition. So we're not sort of identifying, you know, again, sort of like what you could be doing. Um, but it's broken down into different categories, academics, engagement, operations, and planning administration. There's also an innovation category as well. So the idea is if we need to understand where we want to go, like how um, innovative and sort of uh, all the different opportunities related to sustainability performance, we first need to understand where we are currently. So STARS enables institutions to measure their comprehensive sustainability performance. Without a doubt, I think every institution goes through this process, uh, and this doesn't matter whether they're a well-funded institution or under-resourced institution, they go through this process and they basically realize, oh, I thought we were doing better than we actually are. Um, so it has, uh, it's been an incredibly valuable tool for our community for advancing sustainability in higher education. All the data that's compiled is publicly available. So any of you can go online now, whether it's your alma mater, whether it's institutions that you're considering attending, and see if they're participating and see about their sustainability performance. Um, Basically, again, positive uh, recognition, so institutions can get a bronze, silver, gold, or platinum, but the one furthest, I guess, on the right uh, is reporter. So we wanted to recognize institutions for simply reporting their data if they're not motivated by the, the, the flashy sort of bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. They didn't want to do points. We wanted to give them basically credit for publicly reporting their data. Transparency is a fundamental within the sustainability community, right? So the, the reporter opportunity provides the institution to be transparent about how they're doing, uh, but it doesn't sort of give them a, a score. We have, um, and in fact, I think I have it, we have um, in about, I mean, it changes basically every day, almost 900 institutions um, from 38 different countries participating in this. So it has become the global standard for measuring sustainability in higher education. And the fact that we have built um, a system, a tool, 
that has helped um, institutions in the Middle East um, throughout Europe, Asia. We just launched in Australia. Advance and really have a conversation about sustainability is probably one of the most moving and inspiring things to me about my work at Ishii. Um, it is like anything else, it's imperfect, right? It's on a path of continuous improvement. So the version of STARS that we have right now is gonna be updated and then we'll probably launch um, a new version later this spring. So we're really trying to recognize that even though it would be nice to be like, oh, we finished this assessment, now we're done with sustainability. There's no finish line, right? There's no finish line as it relates to sustainability because we need to keep raising the bar. And unfortunately, the challenges are only going to get more substantial. Um, so with that, STARS recognizes uh, institutions, again, that are working in a number of different ways to advance their institution sustainability goals. So some of the benefits, again, you can gain international recognitions for your sustainability efforts, generate new ideas. We've had people go through the STARS process that um, basically decided to have their entire institution strategic plan be informed by sustainability. Like now it's totally revamped. Um, it engages your community. So STARS, because it's comprehensive, it is a requirement, essentially, to work across the entire campus. Um, and a, a reminder here, too, back on the first slide about sustainability, this is not an environmental assessment. This is a sustainability assessment. So within it, we have not just academics and operations, but we have questions around faculty opportunities, how you're treating your staff, diversity and affordability, human resources. Um, so again, this the, the process of going through STARS Basically, engaging your community is part of a requirement, really, because you're having to go collect all of this data. Again, as I mentioned, it creates a baseline for continuous improvement, understanding where are we starting. And one of the things that I think it really helps institutions hone in on is the top key areas where they can be most impactful, right? There might be dozens and dozens of actions that you want to be able to do to advance your sustainability performance. But as a result of going the, through this process, the, the key pieces of like, wow, I didn't realize we're doing so bad here, or that there's such a, a big opportunity for improvement here, it really does help the institution hone in on, on key priorities, and therefore also helps to um, inform strategic planning and budgeting, integrating sustainability into the curriculum, again, going back to generating new ideas. As a result of going through this process, it's sort of like, oh, we don't have anything related to sustainability in education, sustainability in research, sustainability in new student orientation, just as examples. Um, so it really helps institutions have some real progress towards sustainability. And again, it's part of this global community with you know the 800 some that are, are participating at this point in time. If you're interested, I mentioned that all of the data is publicly available, but we also have these annual reports essentially that we've put out that really recognizes the top performing institutions as well as some key success stories uh, for the past several years. So these are all readily, readily available on our website. And I wanted to hone in recognizing that here we are at TCC, um, hone in on a few different uh, examples of institutions that are really noteworthy. Because I think so easily there is an excuse not to do sustainability related work, right? Like, oh, we're too big, we're too small. Oh, we don't have the money. But the truth is there's money found for other initiatives all the time. So here is an example for, for some of the naysayers that are like, oh, we could never do that. These are community colleges that are recognized within our Sustainable Campus Index, the top performers, um, for the past year. So in the 2018 Sustainable Campus Index, these top institutions, the top 10, all community colleges recognizing and, and really being identified for their exemplary sustainability work. So again, in terms of models for success for TCC, there's a lot. Um, so again, I mentioned within STARS, it's sort of broken down by different categories and subcategories. So Nova, Nova Scotia Community College, College was in the top 10 of the energy section. Within the energy section of STARS, uh, it basically recognizes institutions that have reduced their building energy usage, usage and support the development um, and, and use of, of energy from clean and renewable sources. So again, Nova Scotia Community College, top 10, and that's of all institutions, not just the community college um, listing. Again, Central Car Carolina Community College, to give you a sense, their top 10 in food and dining. Within the food and dining section of STARS, we're recognizing institutions who are supporting sustainable food systems through their food and beverage purchases and minimizing the impact of their dining op 
operations. Again, reminiscent of some of the content from over here. Cascadia College is number one. So again, this ranking, um, and actually we do call it a rating system, in the Sustainable Campus Index, it's the only place where we actually have like a top 10, like the David Letterman top 10 list. And that was to try and really respond to a lot of the um, requests that we've been getting for recognizing institutions in that way. We were really rem like hesitant to do it. And the reason is because we don't want to say you're the best and you're the worst. The rating system allows us to sort of categorize these successes with the precious metals. But after many years, and because it started happening elsewhere with other people ranking them, we were like, well, let's try and take control of how this is being presented. So with that being said, within the Sustainable Campus Index, Cascadia College is number one of all the institutions that participated in STARS last year. They are number one in the grounds section, which uh, recognizes institution that manages their grounds sustain excuse me, sustainably. Um, so there's so many notable examples of community colleges really that are excelling in terms of their sustainability performance and being recognized for it throughout the globe through our STARS rating system. Religious institutions recognizing that obviously, so there's a key one here, number of different religious institutions, this actually isn't even a comprehensive list, but those that have committed to sustainability and are actively involved in STARS that are trans, um, looking to track their data and actually, again, be on a path of continuous improvement. So the, again, sort of this idea of like, oh, we couldn't do that, we could never do that. There's so many examples of institutions that have really risen above their internal hurdles, budgetary challenges, to be able to participate. So we've talked about um, sort of the, the social and environmental priorities of why this work matters, why it's important, but I also recognize that at the end of the day, I mean, I manage the organization's budget, there's a bottom line, right? And the document here uh, that we put out, Beyond the Right Thing to Do, uh, we put out a couple of years ago, and it really is a business case. So beyond the warm-hearted, we just wanna do the right thing, this document, and I'll just run through a couple of bullet points, highlights the value of sustainability in higher education from a financial perspective. And it sort of exam shares examples of things perhaps people aren't thinking about. So sustainability education prepares students for career success and responsible citizenship. Sustainability improves organization efficiency, decreases operational costs, and reduces risk. Sustainability helps attract, retain, and motivate top students and employees. And I'll pause there actually to note, it's listed over here on the poster. The Princeton Review has a stat that they've put out uh, from one of their surveys that they've done for more than a decade now. And it always hovers around, it started in 63%, but now hovers around 68% of incoming freshmen prioritize an institution's sustainability performance in deciding where they go to school. So, I believe, and I'm not too sure how long this will be, but I believe that unless institutions are prioritizing sustainability from an academic, incorporating sustainability into their curriculum, uh, from an academic sense as well as an operational sense and looking to try and demonstrate the institution minimizing their environmental and social footprint, I think that they're gonna be uh, not long for the, the higher education world. Unfortunately, the landscape of higher education right now is faced with some significant challenges of institutions closing, et cetera. Um, in terms of interest in sustainability curriculum and expectations around incoming students and their parents around an institution's sustainability performance, it's only going to become more important. Sustainability strengthens community relations and facilitates new partnerships. I think I've learned um, quite a bit about Tulsa in the last couple of days and recognized there's some really great models of um, cross-sector partnerships. And I think, uh, again, in general, this has been really successful. There are institutions that have gone into huge um, purchasing agreements with community partners around renewable energies, uh, around other sort of significant sustainability impacts in communities throughout the country. Um, so recognizing that there's real value and opportunity that sustainability creates um, in, in identifying some potential partnerships. 
Sustainability research and education demonstrates relevance in addressing grand challenges and helps unify the campus around sh a shared sense of purpose. So this is, again, going back to the Talwar Declaration, right, of like, why do higher education institutions exist? And we cannot just be examples of like uh, the ivory towers or behind the gates of like, this is our little island, right? The, the institution has to remain relevant to what's happening, the challenges around the world uh, and around the community. And this here, I think, again, if an institution isn't responsive to the challenges of the community, um, especially that the students are facing, that they're, again, going to be facing some serious decline in um, enrollment. Here, I, I, I jumped the gun on my Princeton Review stat here. Um, the, the document that I just uh, shared, the value of uh, higher education uh, beyond doing the right thing, is free on our website. And it's really meant to be sort of a little bit of a guide for sustainability champions and advocates to be able to have a conversation with their administrators around increased funding opportunities as a result of sustainability performance. Again, sort of attracting students, of, of uh, meeting the expectations of students and, uh, and their parents around sustainability in terms of academics as well as in terms of operational performance. So in terms of recognizing, we did a, a look back and just in the next couple of minutes before we do q and I wanna recognize sort of where we are right now and where we're going. Anybody here know about the Sustainable Development Goals? Groovy. So in 2015, the UN um, put out the, the Sustainable Development Goals. And again, as I mentioned earlier about the Brundtland Commission, um, that when the UN puts something out like this, it is, at least in other parts of the globe, something that people pay attention to. So the SDGs, I think because of the relevance of so many of these challenges really appearing at the doorsteps of institutions and communities around the world, have really um, taken on new life. The SDGs, we have corporations that are now trying to figure out how they can uh, fully immerse themselves within the SDGs. Um, again, within our academic community, SDGs are now being um, included into the curricula, trying to understand when we're talking about sustainability, uh, what do we actually mean? And the 17 SDGs here uh, really sort of help to identify that th it is not just an environmental conversation, right? That there are social dimensions here that are intimately interrelated to these environmental challenges that we're facing. Um, so I'm really excited. I mentioned that um, STARS is being used by institutions in 38 different countries. So you can imagine this important um, standard for sustainability in higher education. We've gotten a lot of interest saying, well, what about the SDGs? How is STARS recognizing the SDGs? So um, this, I mentioned that we are going to be launching a new version of STARS um, coming later this spring. Every single STARS credit that we have within the system will be aligned with the relevant SDG. So what, what's important there is I think um, that we're looking beyond our individual campuses, right? That we're thinking about as exciting as all of this work is here and the, and the amount of time that um, it takes for some of these successes to happen, but how do we connect those impacts we're having within our campus to the global goals? And I think that's motivating, it's inspiring, and it's helpful for individuals to connect efforts from within the campus, within the community, to these global goals. Um, I would definitely encourage you to look more into the, the SDGs. They really have been such a phenomenal teaching tool. Um, and AC is really excited to be champion. We had our, our conference last fall all focused on the SDGs. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to spearhead so this new version of STARS that is intimately t connected to the SDGs. Another example, especially that um, uh, sort of really speaks to the power of partnerships is the We Are Still In coalition that really stem from the US pulling out of the Paris Agreement. Um, so the We Are Still In coalition is made up of, as you can see here, it's, it started within the corporate community, but really has stemmed throughout, throughout a number of different sectors. And the idea here is that these various sectors are recognizing the importance of everything listed here, everything listed here. While climate change obviously is a focus and a priority for a lot of these conversations, when you look at the SDGs, you understand sort of the, the scale, the breadth and the depth of the sustainability challenges and opportunities that we're talking about. 
So the We Are Still In Coalition, again, just a really interesting and exciting model for cross-sector partnership around advancing sustainability goals and could be really helpful and, and, and informative to uh, some of the conversations here around partnerships. So in terms of partnerships, you know, I mentioned that AISHI's mission is to inspire and catalyze higher education to lead the global sustainability transformation. But the truth is, Higher education cannot do it alone. It is not just going to be um, at colleges and universities that basically save the world. And in fact, I believe that you can't have a sustainable campus without engaging the corporate community, right? Um, so this year, our annual conference, which happens in, in October each year, is going to be focused on co-creating a sustainable economy, recognizing that obviously we've talked about the importance of higher education institutions in advancing sustainability, but again, we can't do it alone. We have to identify key sector partners, um, and we're in the process now of identifying keynotes, et cetera, that, those will, that will be able to come and represent their ideas for how we can effectively and hopefully sooner than later really uh, advance the sustainable economy. So I want to end with one of my heroes. Uh, Wangari Mathai was a um, champion and environmental advocate in, U in uh, Kenya and Uganda, uh, won the N Nobel Peace Prize in 2011, I think. Sadly, she passed away in 2012, just before she was supposed to be our keynote speaker. Um, but this quote really resonates with me, and I hope it does with you too. We cannot tire or give up. We owe it to the present and future generations of all species to rise up and walk. With that, thank you. I think we're going to do Q&A. Do we have time? Great. I didn't talk my, your ears off. Maybe I did. Who has a question for the annoying student activist? <laughs> Great, so K through 12, is that, yeah. So great question, um, or do we plan on having some of our work in K through 12? Um, so AISHI, there's something that nonprofits are very aware of called mission creep, and we wanna stay in our lane. However, uh, because there are other organizations out there, um, actually in the sustainability in K through 12, there's actually numerous organizations similar to AISHI's that um, are working to advance sustainability. And I can definitely share some resources for you. I think we are very interested in creating a bit of a bridge, right? Like, how do we make sure that students are graduating from high school with, again, some of these this knowledge and tools and, again, expectations uh, for college? But beyond, we, um, we created something a few years ago with a partner of boarding schools that came to us and said, we're not really like regular K through 12s, we're more like a higher ed campus. So they made sort of this compelling argument for them participating in STARS. Um, because the tool you know, that we're proud to say STARS is um, made for and, and by higher education, um, it, it doesn't fit well for another sector, right? So I think there are some, the Green Schools Network, Green Schools Alliance, there's so many other organizations out there for K through 12. I'm really interested in obviously supporting their efforts. There hasn't been sort of a clear, oh, this is what we should do together, um, but certainly open to those ideas and I can try and find some, some of those organizations to put you in touch with. Other questions? Uh, hi, you had on the just some of the names of schools you showed us. It seemed like you had a lot of penetrance with Canadian schools. So I was just wondering if there's a story there, and if you go outside of North America. Yeah, great question. Thank you. So um, when we started again, now it's like 13 or so years ago, uh, when we grew out of this network from the Pacific Northwest to be a national organization, we recognized that there was a lot of momentum in Canada, and Canada was also very eager to say, "Hey, can we?" be a part of AISHI. Um, and early on, even we, we've been sort of uh, reticent to sort of have boundaries on the work that we do, like where it extends to. Um, but we also recognize that there are AISHI-like organizations elsewhere. So Canada um, and institutions in Canada have been members of AISHI from the beginning. And we accept members from anywhere. So we have institutions from various countries that are part of our community. Um, but we also recognize that there are AISHI-like organizations. We work closely with uh, an AISHI-like organization in Australia, uh, the UK, 
I'm working right now to help build one in China. Um, so in any event, we definitely have the doors open for everybody, but also recognize that there is important work happening on the more local or country level with other organizations uh, that are similar to ours. And there's actually something called the Global Alliance. Um, it's an informal network that uh, was started probably in 2015, and it was the first time again that I was able to really understand the um, global work the, of like the, I, I, even within Aishi, perhaps it's from like my change agent days at UB, I was feeling like, oh, well, this is happening here. But the Global Alliance, this meeting in 2015, really opened my eyes to what's happening throughout the world and the fact there's so many other networks like ours out there. So there's definitely a lot of work uh, happening. And again, our doors are open for anybody that wants to be a part of it. Yeah. So you mentioned the AC mentorship program. Yeah. Is that only for professionals in the workplace, or would that also apply to students who want to get a sustainability movement on campus and there's no other traction? That's a great question. And thus far, it's only two years old. It has been for professionals. Um, a lot of that's been because of demand, right? So, And there's limitation, unfortunately, of capacity. But that's definitely an interesting idea uh, to extend, extend to those interested in getting into the field. Um, National Wildlife Federation is one of our key partners and have done a conference the past couple of years, a virtual conference on eco-careers, et cetera. So we've tried to sort of um, create opportunities for, for partnership and where possible to support those that are looking to get into the field. We do have probably 600 students that come to our conference each year. There's a whole student summit. Um, for a day long ahead of our, our regular conference. So there's certainly opportunities for integrating within our community for those that are interested in trying to get a position. And I would also say the AC Bulletin that I mentioned, the free weekly newsletter lists job opportunities. Um, and there are, so we have something else I didn't mention called AC Affiliates that you can look at on our, our website. These are sort of uh, mostly informal networks on a regional basis that are supporting institution, individuals rather in sustainability and higher education. So that also connecting with some of those on a regional level. And I don't believe there's one in Oklahoma that could be something, an opportunity to talk to the committee about. Um, but there, there sort of are other ways to connect on a local level. Um, in addition to potentially even coming to the AC conference, which is going to be in Spokane, Washington. And I've never been there this year. Two places this year I've never been to. Other questions? Um, hello. So I'm one of those activists in the corner trying to make all the change I can. Groovy. Um, so TCC, I'm a TCC student, and we're making great strides towards sustainability. But it's sometimes difficult to engage the higher up, the people at the very top. Yeah. Um, are there some easier pathways that we can get recognition for that aren't as difficult as some other ones? Mm -hmm. And do your awards, are they enough of a goal for us to pay to, to our presidents, to our provosts, to those people, to actually engage them and say, hey, if we can do this and this, our institution can be that? So there's a lot in there. I appreciate that question. Um, a couple of thoughts. The first thing that comes to mind is actually uh, something that the Director of Sustainability at Darth Dartmouth shared on a panel presentation a couple of years ago, which I think is really profound, especially in this day and age where we can't really, unfortunately, aren't having as much healthy discourse as I think many of us would like, to think about basically putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And as a student activist or whomever that you're looking to try and really create some systemic change, to think about what are the problems that are keeping up your senior leaders at night? And how can the work of sustainability agents address those challenges? And the, the conversation that um, this woman, uh, Rosie from Dartmouth, uh, had mentioned, she was like, what my president is worried about, uh, you know, he's worried about a campus assault. He's worried about safety. He's worried about all these different things. And she basically was like how her work was trying to align their, their concerns, the administration's concerns, with opportunities for advancing sustainability. I share that because I think that's a really interesting, well, it's a helpful reminder, right? That and unfortunately we often need reminders to consider somebody else's perspective. Um, but I share that because I think in addition to the fact that um, there's a number, any, any institution is probably at uh, any given moment faced with a number of challenges, that senior leaders, and I think a lot of folks aren't necessarily against the idea of trying to create a healthier world, but they are more focused in many cases on 
more pressing financial issues that are right in front of them. So if you can try and tie in, and this is where the document, the Beyond um, Doing the Right Thing, the value of sustainability in higher education, if you can try and tie in some long-term positive impacts or even short-term positive impacts, um, in terms of sort of the um, prestige of the ACI Awards, I mean, I, I certainly think, and this is why we hear every year from campuses, from board members, et cetera, that are like, we need more award categories because it, it's just an opportunity for raising awareness and it feels good, right? So when a campus is being celebrated for one of these key accomplishments and being recognized on this international platform, to me, that's compelling. And I think to any senior leader, it would be compelling. And one other quick story is um, a woman named Maria, who's a, just a fierce change agent at uh, the Dallas County Community College District. Um, she had a new president come on board maybe like three weeks before the ACI conference, and they were getting an award. And Maria was so excited to be able to introduce herself and uh, the sustainability champion and say that we're getting this award. And the president, three weeks on the job, was like, so who gets that? And she was like, uh, who accepts it? And she was like, the president. So that meant the president was at the Aishi conference on stage getting this award, and he was like, groovy, like, this is awesome. So she had a, a basically a, um, an advocate from the beginning because she had this cool story. So that's just one example, but I'm sure there are others of really these um, sort of turning points for institutions as a result of a positive accolade like the Aishi award. So something to consider for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, up here. Related to higher education, but I saw on your, we are all in, that there are nine tribes that are yep. a part of that. Do you know those tribes? And um, also I was wondering, are there any organizations forwarding sustainability for tribes? Wait, say that last part again. Do you know of any like sustainability organizations uh, trying to yep. uh, make it more known for with the tribes gotcha. themselves. So um, we are still in. I'm a, a supportive outsider of the effort, right? So um, we've our, our members have signed. Many of our members have signed on, et cetera. And again, other we're we're sort of on the uh, the outside, but a, a supporter of it. So I, I actually don't know much about it, but I will say in general, um, in in terms of efforts around engaging tribes on sustainability, I think. Um, it is fair to say that we have a pretty white movement, uh, sustainability in general. However, that is not uh, to say that there hasn't been significant um, environmental and environmental justice efforts and accomplishments over decades that have not been at the front forefront, unfortunately. And Aishi is actually, um, we have a diversity, equity, and inclusion platform um, that uh, has been happening basically for the past couple of years. Every year we're trying to prioritize uh, speakers around social justice and equity. You cannot have a sustainable campus without addressing equity and social justice. Um, but even for myself, I'm feeling like we need to do more. We need to do more beyond the keynote speakers. What does that look like? And I was even chatting with one of the poster presenters earlier saying, if you thought about uh, engaging with your diversity and inclusion office on campus, right? Like what these opportunities look like for um, sustainability and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion to be partners on campus because I think these conversations are so interconnected and yet they've been separate in many cases on different campuses. Campuses. Um, so my sense is I actually think that um, some of the sustainability, um, the way that we're talking about it and our frames are inherent in a lot of the tribes. Um, and I would say that there's probably a number of different organizations out there, uh, again, sort of as the similar question. I don't have them in the top of my head, but uh, certainly I would, I would absolutely bet that they are out there because environmental justice is not new at all. I mean, for decades now, um, there are examples and models of environmental uh, justice um, efforts throughout the country, really, and actually one in Buffalo too, Love Canal. Anybody here remember Love Canal? Anywho, I digress. Hey, <laughs> well, you're from New York though, so. <laughs> um, 
in any event, I, I don't have the specific examples, but that's a, a great question, and now I'm, I'm eager to go learn about those organizations. Particularly, we've been in Minnesota, uh, our conference, a couple of years ago, where we had a significant presence from tribal colleges and institutions uh, throughout the area. And uh, this year being in Spokane, Washington, and Eastern Washington, we're hopeful that that'll be another uh, significant presence, too. Yeah. Sure. Um, so when you're talking about there's so many young people who are very, very keen on the sustainability front, um, there are a large population of those students, but we also have another population who still doesn't even care about recycling sure. or something like that. You know, from what we find in the waste audit, yeah. there's still so many people don't care about yeah. separating those things. Is there any tips that you can give us in terms of how we can encourage the people who are not in the sustainability agenda to be more aware. Yeah, I mean, Key, that's like, that's the question, right? What we're talking about here is how do you change behavior? Um, and there's research and there's studies and there's, you know, again, decades of examples of some success stories, um, but then, you know, that changes. And unfortunately, people and institutions have had, um, sort of like a backslide, right, and in terms of their, imp their impact, their footprint. So, I mean, the conversations that we had at the University of Buffalo when I was an undergrad are still happening probably there, as well as at, on campuses throughout the country. So sometimes I'm, I'm sort of comforted by, you know, misery loves company. I, there, this is a challenge that everyone is facing. And I think the key question is how are we going to really move people to understand their role um, in helping to reduce the, the impact that they're having? Um, I think this is sort of the, the key opportunity for higher education institutions because students are there to learn. And from the moment that students step on campus, how does the institution make sure that sustainability is a priority? That it's part of every single day of the students' lives and really the campus community. That's what a lot of our campuses are trying to do. I mentioned new student orientation. From like the moment they understand to be an undergrad or to be a student at this campus, there's a sustainability, even an expectation. Um, but I will tell you, like the, the challenge of getting people to put the right thing in the right bin, I'm not sure what is ever gonna be sort of like the, the one solution that, that changes that. But I do think having sustainability be thread throughout the fabric of the institution. So they are seeing it everywhere they turn and understand, oh, I know the expectation of me. And I know why these three different bins are here and what I need to do. Um, I mean, institutions, you know, carry their own water bottles, their own coffee mugs, like trying to reduce waste. There's ways that uh, institutions, I think, can really make sure to make it fun, to make it cool. Um, so hopefully that helps. There's, there's an effort called Campus is Living Labs that um, is, is something that's been a real popular trend for the past many years with the idea being how do we make sure that there's an opportunity for stu students to learn about sustainability, not just like within uh, a particular building on campus, but everywhere they walk on campus. Um, so I hope that helps, but the truth is it's, uh, it's a matter of how do we change hearts and minds, and that's gonna be different. So trying to figure out how we can um, connect with the, those incoming students, not just the freshmen either, but stay connected throughout their, their time on campus, that's up to you folks, right? That's a local conversation. That's sort of an institution-wide conversation, but I think trying to have ubiquity, like how do we make sure sustainability is not just something over there in a corner, but really, again, thread throughout the fabric of the institution. Yep. Groovy. Hey, thanks, everybody. I really love Tulsa, so thanks for having me.